couple of scriptures before Brother Dan comes with a message. In Psalms 19, beginning in verse 12, the psalmist says, Who can understand his errors? And cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. This, this verse right here has meant a lot to me. I want you to listen to this. Verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If there's anybody that we need to please with our thoughts and our deeds, it's God. Let's be in prayer for Brother Daniel. Lord, thank you for the time. I want to thank the Lord for this another opportunity to be here today to, to be able to share his word. Turn with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where the message will be coming from today. Uh, also, if you want to turn to 637 in your songbook, that will be our song of invitation. At that time, if there's anybody here that's, that's not a Christian, uh, if you've heard the word and, and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and you've repented, and you've, you've asked the Lord to help you turn your life around and start living for Him, then during that song, if you would come forward, we would uh, give you the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ before men and be baptized for remission of sins. Um, never fails to amaze me, Tom. Um, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He used that verse and he, and he said we need to please God. Let's look at verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. This is the same message that, that Paul has given to the church here at Thessalonica. He wants everybody to please God. That's what we need to do in our lives. We need to please God. And it says we need to walk and to please God. You know, if you stand still in your Christian experience or in anything in life, you're not going to move forward at all. And if we're not moving forward, we're probably moving backward. If you're a Christian today, you need to be living for the Lord. You need to be walking for the Lord. You need to be doing everything you can to please Him. It says, so ye would abound more and more. It's something we need to continue in. We need to continue to get stronger and stronger in the Lord. Peter, at the end of his second letter, says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We need to continue to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Paul didn't say these are commands from him. He said they're commands from the Lord Jesus. And he says the church at Thessalonica knows what these commands are. And we can go through the New Testament. We've got them all in there. And, it, and it's over and over. There's a lot of them. First and foremost would be to love your fellow man. Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. We need to love our fellow man in the same way that Jesus loved us. And you know how much he loved us. He stretched out his arms and said, I love you this much. He gave his life for us. And we need to be the same way with our friends and our Christian brothers and sisters. We're to love them. We're to feed and clothe people when they're in need. We're to visit people when they're sick or in prison. We're told, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Yes, there's commandments we need to follow in this life. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. If you go back to Genesis 6, Verse 5, just before the flood, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. 
Look at the United States today. I'll compare it to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the way we're headed. We are heading that direction. It's slow. You know, you start a snowball on a hill and, and drop it down. If you got a real slow incline, that's the way it's rolling. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Fornication is only part of the problem. But it's definitely one of the problems. We look at, look at the world today and look at the United States today and look at the TV programs that we have on. People don't even know what fornication is. Fornication is any kind of sexual relationship that's not between man and wife. People, Brother Tom mentioned that a preacher here in Morgan County preached a sermon on living together, on couples that live together. And he was told afterwards that you offended somebody. My comment was he didn't preach it hard enough. He needed to preach it some more. His comment was that's some place he's got to stay away from. We can't shun to declare the entire counsel of God. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. By vessel, they're talking about your spouse, your husband, or your wife. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Concupiscence is a desire for what is forbidden. That seems to be what everybody wants today, to get as close to what's forbidden as they possibly can. But by then, it's too late. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testify. In Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, we're told, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Don't be deceived. The things that we're doing in this world, the things that we're doing in the United States today, they're abominable to God. The places we're going, the things that we're doing in these United States, you know, I, what we need in the United States today is Jonah. For him to come in and say, repent. That's what the United States needs to do. It's repent. The world needs to repent today. And we need a Jonah to come in and tell us that we need to repent. That we need to start living for the Lord again. That we need to once again become a Christian nation. And not to continue on this, this gradual slope that we're on. It sneaks in so slowly that we don't even notice it. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before. In the 1970s, might have been late 60s even. All in the family started using swear words. They were allowed to use two in a half hour program. And that is just gradually snowballed. Kind of gradually got bigger and bigger. And you can't watch a program today without several different times of foul language in it. They just don't even make them anymore. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God wants us to live a righteous life. God doesn't want us to live sinful lives. That's man. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We can't continue to live evil lives. We can't continue to live the way that we're going today. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, or rejects not man, but God, who hath also given us, or unto us, his Holy Spirit. If you've been baptized for remission of sins today, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the Holy Spirit's temple. And we are blessed to be able to have the Holy Spirit living within us. And if we read the scriptures and we continue to, to study the Holy Spirit is there for us. He brings things to our remembrance. He helps us out in our everyday life. And He helps us to live as, as we ought to live. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not what I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We can go back to Leviticus 19, and it says, Love your neighbor as yourself. That's in the Old Testament. 
But I, I mentioned earlier, Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's a much greater love. And Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. For greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And he tells us that we are his friends if we do whatsoever he commands. Again, we go back to the commands. We need to follow these commands in order to please God. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we bespeak, beseech you, brethren, or we beg of you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. They were doing the things they should be doing. They were helping out others in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 7. We're told, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Asia. They were doing the things they should be doing. They were examples as they should be examples. But he said that they needed to increase more and more. Again, if we stand in one spot, we're not going to increase. If we stand in one spot, we're, we're probably going to decrease because we're not doing anything. Now, we mentioned in, uh, in the business meeting last night, somebody had made a little mistake on one of the little flyers. You know, if we never do anything is the only way we'll never make any mistakes. We've got to keep doing things. We've got to keep doing things for the Lord. That doesn't mean we won't make mistakes from time to time. But if all we do is stand there and never move, we can't please God. We're not doing what the Lord wants us to do. Remember the parable of the, the talents. The one that was given one talent, buried him. He didn't do anything. He just stood there. And this was not pleasing to the Lord. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. Walk toward them that are without, meaning those that are that are of the earth, those that are not Christians, and that they may have lack of nothing. We'll go back to verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Again, it's a commandment. To, to study uh, and be quiet means to have concern about other people, but not to be not to be meddlesome, not to be putting your nose in places it doesn't belong, but to be quiet and to to be concerned about those things. But we do have our own business and we need to work with our own hands as we're given command. And, and we go uh, also in Thessalonians here 3 verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Christians are not lazy people. There are people in this world that need help. And there are Christians in this world that need help. And we need to do all we can to help them. But just to sit around and not do anything is not pleasing God. We need to work with the sweat of our brow, with our hands. We need to get out and do the things that the Lord would want us to do, things that would be pleasing to Him. Verse 12, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. Those that are not members of the church. What do they think if they see somebody that's saying they're a Christian and they never do any work? That they never do anything. And they just rely on other people to take care of them. That's not a Christian attitude and that's not the way it should be. And that they may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Here Paul tells them about those that have, that have gone on already, those that have passed away. Sleep is used several times in the scriptures to refer to death. And that's exactly what he's talking about here, concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, the Lord gave us examples of, of how we, we do. It, it should hurt us. It, we should, there should be some sorrow when a relative passes away. You go to the story of uh, Lazarus' death, and we see Mary and Martha. They grieved. And that's a natural thing, and that's a natural process, and we should all go through this, but we shouldn't let it stop our lives because a loved one passes away. We need to continue to live for the Lord. We need to continue to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. How can you call yourself a Christian if you don't believe that? It's the very, very foundation of the Christian religion. That Jesus Christ died, he was dead and buried. But he rose again, he was seen of witnesses. And if it's going to happen to Jesus, God can do the same thing for us. And God will do the same thing for us. It's a promise that he has in his, within the, test, the New Testament. That he's going to do the same thing when the Lord returns. For those that are still living. We'll go to be with them also as we'll, as we'll see here. It says, even as them also which sleep in Jesus. That's an important part of this verse, that it's in Jesus. And God will bring him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Ye shall not all sleep, but ye shall all be changed. There will still be Christians living on this world when Jesus returns. Those two verses both say that. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And the one I just read in 1 Corinthians uh, 4, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. There will be people that are living when the Lord returns that are Christians. So Christianity is going to continue. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is not saying that, that there's going to be several different resurrections as some people would claim. In John 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear my voice and shall come forth. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There will be a resurrection. And it says they will, it says first here, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But it goes right on in that same sentence to tell you what they're first in front of. They're in front of those that are alive and remain. The next verse says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's not going to drop us off and come back down here for a thousand years. I know that's a popular belief. But the Lord, when we go to meet Him in the air, we'll meet Him in the clouds and we'll be with Him for all eternity. And it says here, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If you go back to verse 15, back, back to verse 13, where He says, Sorrow not. This is comforting. These people believe that when somebody passed away, that they missed out because Jesus hadn't returned yet. Tell you, the Lord's at hand. His coming is at hand. It's close. It's it's got to be close. It, and you look at you look at uh, when man was created two thousand years later. Every imagination of the thought of man was only evil continually. Two thousand years later, and the floods came. And two thousand years later, it doesn't say that I found in the scriptures what what kind of attitude people had. But Jesus came at that time and brought people to him. And that was 2,000 years ago. I'm not trying to set any dates here. <laughs> Don't get me wrong now. But it's at hand. The Lord's going to return. The world is getting in the kind of condition it was before the flood. We're turning away from the Lord. Now remember, when the flood came, when all the imaginations, or all the thoughts of the imaginations of man was only evil continually, God found a righteous man among them. A man by the name of Noah. 
and Noah built an ark that mankind might continue. Just want to close out here with 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Just want to read this one verse. It says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We need to watch and pray. We need to continue to be ready for the Lord's return. You know, Sunday school today, we had a lot of talk about what heaven might be like, who we might know when we get there. It really doesn't matter. We know that heaven is a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place. It's a place where it's the abode of God. That love will continue there. We're told here to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We need to do that today. We need to please the Lord by, by doing the things that He would have us to do. We need to continue to please Him and, and continue to live our lives for Him. Because every individual in here wants to spend eternity in heaven. I doubt very seriously that there's one person here that would ever say they want to spend eternity in hell. We've only got just one chance, folks. This is it. This life is the only chance we have. We don't have a second chance. We need to live for the Lord now. We need to continue to please God. We need to continue to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior. This time, let us stand and sing our song of invitation. Number six.